The Lacanian Subject by Bruce Fink. This is chapter 10. Psychoanalysis in Science. The status of psychoanalysis with respect to science is generally discussed in America in the most naive of terms. Science, with a capital S, is assumed to refer to a self-evident set of bodies of knowledge, as opposed to a diverse group of hotly disputed social practices, and a fixed set of verification and refutation procedures, model building methods, concept formulation processes, and so on. That is, when those who discuss science know anything whatsoever of scientific endeavor. Science is not, however, the monolithic edifice positivists and everyday American common sense make it out to be. Work in the history and philosophy of science in the latter part of the 20th century, as well as in the individual sciences themselves, has decisively dispelled the notion that every science is based on a set of axiomatic mathematizable propositions, measurable empirical entities, and pure concepts. There is virtually no agreement among scientists, philosophers, and historians regarding what constitutes a science and what does not. This has not, however, in any way dampened the esteem for science in the United States, where every affirmation must seek its stamp of approval from the recognized scientific authorities and where the solution to every problem is expected to be provided by hard science. Science as discourse. The fact remains that science is a discourse. As banal as that statement may seem, it implies a dethroning of science and a reassessment of science as one discourse among many. Freud may be interpreted as translating rationality into rationalization, and Lacan's discourse theory suggests that there are as many different claims to rationality as there are different discourses, each discourse seeking its own ends and having its own mainspring attempts to make its own form of rationality prevail. There are no doubt several pre- presently existing forms of scientific discourse, some of which, the worst, can be subsumed under the university discourse discussed in the last chapter, science as a justification for and means to further expand the master's power, some under the hysteric discourse, and so on. One useful way of understanding the relationship between psychoanalytic discourse and scientific discourse is, it seems to me, in terms of Lacan's contribution to discourse theory in the 1970s, starting in Seminar 21. Before turning to it, however, let me briefly sketch out his approach to the relationship between psychoanalysis and science in the mid-1960s. Suturing the Subject Lacan, quite interested at the time in establishing psychoanalysis as a science, poses the question as follows. Do all presently existing scientific discourses have something in common? I have already discussed his answer to that question elsewhere in a commentary on science and truth, and will summarize it very briefly here. Science sutures the subject, that is, neglects the subject, excluding the latter from its field. At least it attempts to do so to the fullest extent possible, never fully succeeding. This is as true of Levi Levi Strauss's brand of structuralism as of Newtonian physics. The speaking subject is considered irrelevant to the field. While Lacan was at first excited by the prospect of founding psychoanalysis as a science on bases similar to those, uh, on bases similar to those of of linguistics and structural anthropology, he later distinguished psychoanalysis from the latter two disciplines in that they do not take truth into account. The cause, and thus the subject, that will have resulted from that cause. If science can be said to deal with truth, it is only insofar as it reduces truth to a kind of value. In truth tables, the letters T, true, and F, false, are assigned to various possible combinations of propositions, as in table 10.1, which you can see on page 139. 
If I assert that Lacan was French, proposition, proposition A, and that he never set foot outside of France, proposition B, in order for my statement as a whole to be true, both A and B must be true individually. The four lines in the truth table represent all four possible combinations taken into account by this kind of propositional logic. A can be either true or false, and B can be either true or false. Thus, any combination of their truth values is theoretically possible. If only one of them is true, my statement as a whole is false. It is only when both of them are true that my statement as a whole is true. Science relies on the designations true and false, but they take on meaning only within a propositional or symbolic logic. They are values understandable within the field defined by that science and make no claims to independent validity. True and false are thus simple values in scientific discourse, like plus and minus, zero and one. They are binary opposites that play a role in a specific context. Truth with a capital T, on the other hand, is swept aside, relegated to other disciplines, whether poetry and literature or religion and philosophy. Psychoanalysis, by contrast, gives precedence to that which throws into question the self-confirming nature of its own axioms. The real, the impossible, that which does not work. That is the truth taken responsibility for in psychoanalysis. The major form it takes is the impossibility of sexual relationships. If science can be said to deal with the subject, it is only the conscious Cartesian subject master of its own thoughts, whose thought is correlative to its being. Existing sciences certainly do not take into account the split, subject, the split subject for whom I am where I am not thinking, and I think where I am not. Science, America's foremost de facto meta-language, sutures the Lacanian subject, suturing its cause as truth in the same gesture as it excludes the psychoanalytic subject and object. Lacan's view in the 1960s is that science will have to undergo some serious changes before psychoanalysis can be included within its scope. In other words, the formalization of psychoanalysis into math themes and rigorously defined clinical structures, so characteristic of Lacan's work at that stage, does not suffice, does not suffice to make psychoanalysis into a science for science itself is not yet capable of encompassing psychoanalysis. Science must first come to grips with the specificity of the psychoanalytic object. At that time, then, Lacan's view is that science is not yet equal to the task of accommodating psychoanalysis. In Seminar 10, Lacan associates the supposed progress of science with our increasing inability to think the category cause. Continually filling in the gap between cause and effect, science progressively eliminates the content of the conce concept cause, events being understood as leading smoothly in accordance with well-known laws to other events. Lacan understands cause in a more radical sense, as that which disrupts the smooth functioning of law-like interactions. Causality in science is absorbed into what we might call structure, cause leading to effect within an ever more exhaustive set of laws. A cause is something that seems not to obey laws, remaining inexplicable from the standpoint of scientific knowledge, has become unthinkable, our general tendency being to assume that it will just be a matter of time before science can explain it. What distinguishes psychoanalysis from the sciences is that it takes into account the cause and the subject in his or her libidinal relation to the cause, whereas linguistics, for example, take the subject into account only as determined by the symbolic order, that is, by the signifier. Psychoanalysis thus grapples with the two faces of the subject, one, the pure subject of the combinatory or matrix, the subject without a cause, as it were, and two, the saturated subject, as Lacan calls it, that is, the subject in relation to an object of jouissance, a libidinal object. The subject is a stance adopted with respect to jouissance. The project of Lacanian psychoanalysis is, in the 1960s, to maintain and further explore these two primordial concepts, cause and subject, 
however paradoxical they may seem. At this stage in Lacan's work, the differences between science and psychoanalysis seem altogether insurmountable. Science, the Hysterics, Discourse, and Psychoanalytic Theory This situation changes to some extent when Lacan identifies true scientific discourse with the Hysterics Discourse, as I mentioned in the last chapter. For genuine scientific work does not exclude the cause as that which interrupts the smooth functioning of law-like activity, but rather attempts to take it into account in some way, as in the case of Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle. Here the real up against which science runs is not neatly skirted, but rather brought within the theory it upsets. Truth as the encounter with the real is not alighted, but met head on. The physicist here might be said to allow him or herself to be duped, to work as something other than the knowing subject. In that sense, scientific discourse and the hysterics discourse coincide. But where does that leave psychoanalysis? Psychoanalytic discourse as operative in the analytic setting is clearly distinct from the hysterics discourse and is not involved in theory building, but rather in a praxis defined by specifically psychoanalytic ends. Based on the analyst's enigmatic desire, psychoanalysis aims at subjectification, separation, traversing a fantasy, and so on. It is not a practice based on understanding, either for the analyst or the analysand, but rather on a certain efficiency, in Aristotle's sense of the word. Psychoanalytic discourse, as operative in theory building, on the other hand, insofar as it takes truth seriously, attempting to formulate the encounter with the real cause, functions much like the hysterics discourse, and thus like scientific discourse. It seems to me that just as it is important, even though it involves oversimplification, to distinguish basic science from applied science, that is, goal-oriented science, it is important to distinguish the strictly, the strictly theoretical from the clinical aspects of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis as a whole is a praxis. Nevertheless, its different facets can be examined separately in terms of discourse theory. Psychoanalytic practice, in other words, in the analytic setting, adopts analytic discourse. In the best of cases, that is, for many analysts, clearly adopt someone, something more along the lines of the university discourse. Psychoanalytic theory in teaching adopts the hysterics discourse, once again in the best of cases, for often they become nothing more than doctrinal enterprises designed to gloss over all unanswered questions. Psychoanalytic associations, as social political institutions, may adopt a variety of discourses, hysterics, masters, or university, and while Lacan clearly believed that they should function in a particular way, I shall leave for another occasion a discussion of the discourse they should ideally adopt, according to Lacan, and the discourses they do in fact adopt. This multiplicity of discourses adopted by analysts should not surprise us, for the same is true in other praxes. In clinical practice, the medical doctor may well employ suggestion, threats, placebos, inflated fees, white lies, and whatever else it takes to get his or her patients back on the road to health. In his or her more theoretical enterprises, the medical doctor may adopt the scientific discourse accepted at a particular historical moment, and in, his, and in his or her search for power, prestige, or sheer survival, the medical doctor may turn into a political lobbyist, adopting the discourse of expediency, the master's discourse. The politician adopts the discourse of power, the master's discourse, in the war room, the discourse of democracy and justice, the university discourse, before the public eye, and perhaps even the hysterics discourse in his or her probing discussions with advisors. Even the theoretical physicist, whose field is not constituted as a praxis in my sense of the term, a praxis aims at changing the real, not simply studying it, adopts different discourses depending on whether he or she is in the laboratory, in the classroom, at a department meeting, in discussion with a funding source like the National Science Foundation, or in an interview with Pentagon officials. In any, 
In any praxis and in virtually any field, different discourses are appropriate at different moments and in different historical, social, political, economic, and religious contexts. The three registers and differently polarized discourses. The real is what does not depend on my idea of it. That was a quotation from Lacan. You can't do whatever you want with it. That's another quotation from Lacan. As I mentioned earlier, another useful way to understand the relationship between psychoanalytic discourse and scientific discourse is in terms of Lacan's contrib contribution in the 1970s to discourse theory. In Seminar 21, Lacan provides a way of thinking about discourses that is slightly different from that provided in the four discourses, and subsists alongside the latter, albeit perhaps only at the very beginning of that one seminar. This new way of thinking about different discourses defines each discourse according to the order in which the three registers, imaginary, symbolic, and real, are taken up in it. The discourses that go around the circle in a clockwise direction, RSI, SIR, and IRS, are to be distinguished from those that go around in a counterclockwise direction, RIS, ISR, and SRI. Lacan adopts the term right polarization for clockwise directions and left polarization for counterclockwise directions, terms used to describe the orientation of knots like his Baromian knot. To the best of my knowledge, Lacan never provides a detailed account of all the discourses covered by this particular combinatory. He mentions only two. Religious discourse, which realizes the symbolic of the imaginary, RSI, and psycho psychoanalytic discourse, which imagines the real of the symbolic, IRS. According to Lacan, these two discourses have something in common, as they are both right polarized. But rather than discuss their possible similarities, what I would like to do here is elucidate what Lacan means by imagining the real of the symbolic and suggest how science might be situated in terms of this new combinatory. Mathematics, according to Lacan, was the first discourse to imagine, that is, glimpse, perceive, conceive, that the symbolic order itself contains elements of the real. There are kinks in the symbolic order that constitute logical aporias or paradoxes, and they are ineradicable. A better, purer symbolic system does not eliminate them. There are impossibilities in the symbolic order, such as those laid bare by Godel, briefly discussed in chapters 3 and 7 above, and mathematicians were among the first to imagine them and attempt to conceptualize them. Psychoanalysis follows in the footsteps of, of mathematics, the former thus constituting an IRS discourse as well, by extending the mathematical process. By recognizing object A in brackets, psychoanalysis imagines or takes cognizance of the real of in the symbolic this is another way of saying that psychoanalytic theory building ideally comes under the hysterics discourse, as I said earlier, but it also allows us to talk about the psychoanalytic process in the same breath. The analyst in the analytic setting listens for the real impossibilities in the analysis symbolic and attempts to hit that real with interpretation. The IRS classification Thus allows us to talk about psychoanalytic theory and practice in the same term. It characterizes psychoanalysis as a praxis. Lacan never says how he would classify science in terms of this new combinatory, but I would venture to suggest that the best science, like mathematical logic a la Goodell, could be considered an IRS discourse. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle certainly recognizes and grapples with the real of the symbolic order constituted by modern physics, as does other work in the sciences. Physics will never constitute a, practice, a praxis in the sense that psychoanalysis does. While psychoanalysis aims not at the analysis good, as understood by most current social and political discourse, but at his or her greater eros. Physics does not seek to change the real it studies. It has no aims in mind for space, time, and matter. Nevertheless, both constitute IRS discourses and thus have a certain orientation in common. 
formalization and the transmissibility of psychoanalysis. In the late 1950s and 1960s, Lacan makes a considerable effort to formulate and abbreviate psychoanalytic concepts in the guise of symbols, or mathemes, as he calls them. The term matheme is modeled on phoneme, semanteme, and mytheme, the smallest units of speech, meaning, and myth, respectively, and the symbols Lacan invents are quasi-mathematical in nature, providing formula-like expressions. No shit. In the 1960s, Lacan takes formalization, mathematization, to be one of the main characteristics of science. That being a key to 100% transmissibility, the ability to integrally transmit something from one person to another. Each math theme condenses and embodies, in a sense, a considerable quantity of conceptualization, yet each is also highly polyvalent, as the reader will have noticed in the course of this book. While math themes or formulas cannot, in and of themselves, guarantee the integral transmission of an idea or concept from one person to another, a sort of ideal communication, I see what you mean, that Lacan himself decisively critiques, the essence of all communication being miscommunication, what is transmitted is the math theme itself. As a bit of writing, as a written trace, mathemes can be handed down from generation to generation, or even buried in the sand, dug up again millennia later, and interpreted as signifying a subject to another signifier. Early on, Lacan's concern with the transmissibility of psychoanalysis is clearly based on English and American misinterpretation of Freud's work in particular, his hope being that such misinterpretation can be avoided by formulations and formulation, formalization akin to those of the hard sciences. At the same time, however, he sought to avoid saying things in a simplistic manner and to discourage his students from all too quickly thinking they understood Freud's texts, their analysis speech, or Lacan's own words. While Lacan at one point boasts that he has reduced psychoanalysis to set theory, that is, an integrally transmissible discourse, Lacanian psychoanalysis remains anything but a finite system of definitions and axioms. Nevertheless, it does move in the direction of increasing literalization, formalizations or formulations involving letters and symbols, in other words, mathemes, a process of symbolization that inscribes qualitative relations, not quantitative ones. Like the figures discussed at the end of chapter 8, whose dimensions can be varied indefinitely without ever changing their fundamental topological properties, the relations written or ciphered using Lacan's algebra are qualitative, structural relations. Lacan's search for a non-quantitative kind of formalization can be seen in what he terms the pass. The pass is a process wherein someone who has gone through analysis talks about his or her analysis in detail with two other people, who in turn report on what they have heard, heard to a committee. The process was devised in part to gather information on the analytic process, independent of what the analyst him or herso herself provides, and to thus confirm or refine notions about what actually occurs in analysis. The past could be understood as a way of establishing psychoanalysis as a practice involving a number of generic procedures, as Alain Badu calls them, procedures that are repeated again and again with different analyses. Thus understood, the past could be considered part of a larger attempt to establish a kind of scientificity particular to psychoanalysis. The status of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is to, be, is to be taken seriously, even though it is not a science. That is a quotation from Lacan. Lacan's discussion of right and left polarized discourses suggests that the four discourses are not the only discourses imaginable. The latter do nevertheless cover a great deal of ground and are extremely useful in examining the mainsprings and aims of various discourses. Most notably for our purposes here, they allow us to situate true scientific endeavor as part and parcel of the hysterics discourse. While science and psychoanalytic theory building have that much in common 
And while both are IRS discourses, psychoanalysis is not a science, but a discourse that allows us to understand the structure and operation of scientific discourse at a certain fundamental level. Thus, while psychoanalysis, in its Lacanian version, seeks its own proper forms of scientificity, formalization, mathemization, generic procedures, rigorous clinical differentiations, and so on, it is nevertheless an independent discourse requiring no validation from science. After all, science with a capital S does not exist. It is but a fantasy. Science is but one discourse among others. The Ethics of Lacanian Psychoanalysis <clears throat> The ethical limits of psychoanalysis coincide with the limits of its practice. That was a quote from Lacan. Lacan provides a sustained attempt to examine ever further the aims of analysis on the basis of advances in theory and to develop ever further theorization on the basis of revised views of the aims of analysis. Analysis is not pragmatic in its aims. If pragmatism means compliance with social, economic, and political norms and realities, it is a praxis of jouissance, and jouissance is anything but practical. It ignores the needs of capital, um, health insurance companies, socialized health care, public order, and mature adult relationships. The techniques that psychoanalysis must use to deal with jouissance wreak havoc on the principle that this that time is money and on accepted notions of professional conduct. While therapists in our society are expected to interact with their patients in ways that are considered by dominant contemporary social, political, and psychological discourses to be for their own good, analysts act instead so as to further their analysis eros. That aim is constitutive of the praxis that is psychoanalysis.